something that I could say is I developed resiliency. Um, I stretched my mind um, in a way that I, I saw my competition. I didn't want it to be better than them. I wanted it to be the better version of me. Nice. I know what I was able to do. Matt Patrick Kelly here on the Knight's Path podcast. So uh, modern day knighthood, my path to the Knight's Path is uh, my, my journey to self-mastery, which is my physical, mental, and spiritual selves. Um, and I do that through a martial way of firearms, empty hands, and weapons other than firearms, all in the hopes to provide products and services that benefit my fellow man. So, and humanity as a whole. Today, I'm super stoked to have a very good friend of mine, Carlos Estrada Vega. And he and I met on a, in a mastermind group. And he's like my brother from another mother. I love him to death. So stoked that he's a jock. He's a stud. We can learn a lot from him. Can't wait to talk to him. But Carlos, welcome to the podcast, brother. Hey, Matt. Thank you for having me, man. This, this is great what you're doing, too. The nice path. I mean, not everybody's doing something like this, but I commend you for actually putting something together and not only being able to actually bring this out to many of those men and people that are looking to actually get to the next stage in their life, but don't know how to get there. So thank you for having me. Yo, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Carlos, I know a little bit about your past, but, you know, as far as, uh, you know, the folks that may be watching this, you know, let's kind of Kind of talk us through how you got here, you know, what you did in school and then your path that you're still on right now. And you've got this amazing career. So walk everybody through that for me, brother. Got it, man. All right, man. Um, for everybody, um, my name is Carlos Estrada Vega. I'm originally from Venezuela. I was born in Venezuela. I'm from Venezuela in Colombia. I was raised in Colombia for a lot of my years. I came to the United States when I was 16 years old. Um, one of the dreams that I came to the United States with was to have a better life um, and play baseball. So I was a baseball player for a young age. I um, played for the Colombian um, team. And when I was 10 years old, around 1990, I came to Miami and represented the Colombian um, selection team uh, in which with the mileage, we were the best team. We won, came back, but I had a taste of what the U.S. was. And I always had that taste since I was 10 years old that I wanted to come to the land of opportunity. Um, I wanted to, to be something better, do something better for myself because I knew where I lived in a third world country and I wasn't able to actually accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. Well, lucky enough, my mom um, took off when I was about 12 years old. She came to the US um, and she worked very hard. Um, to this day, it's one of the, the other than give me birth, one of the best gifts that she ever gave me is um, allow me to come to the U.S. because um, that alone opened the doors, a lot of different doors that I didn't think it was possible for me. For my kid living in, the, in Colombia, in the streets of Colombia, we were very poor. We were very poor. Mm -hmm. We actually survived because of my, what my mom was doing here. So for that, I will always be thankful to her. And um, her coming to the U.S. opened a lot of doors for us. Now, when I came to the U.S., 16 years old, um, I was like a fat kid in a candy store. <laughs> everything, I knew everything, you know, I could do anything that I want. And I continued with my, my dream of playing baseball. So I started playing baseball. I ended up playing minor leagues for the Cyclones until um, I played one, one, one season. The next season, I hurt myself. I tore a, um, a muscle in my shoulder and I was never able to actually continue. So the next best thing that I always wanted to do was the military. I love the military. I love the, the, the persona that these recruiters would come to the school and talk, and talk to, to the kids. I love the way they look. I love the way they carry themselves. So that's something that I always look up into and I, and I want, want it to be. I um, decide against my parents because their dream was not for me to be a baseball player. But coming from a third world country, you either gonna become a doctor or an attorney. <laughs> that was their dream to me or for me, but that was not my dream. So I, I finished there, I was so proud of myself. Um, I tell you what, um, 
me going into the military was one of the best things that I was able to do for myself. Because even though that I have desires, I have no discipline or consistency in anything that I wanted to do. So uh, that took my path, allowed me to actually accomplish everything that I really wanted to accomplish. Give it back to you, man. I took that for, from you for a while. <laughs> so when you, hey, great job. So um, when, when you came over, did you, did you know some English or how, how, how hard was it uh, to, to learn the English language, pick that up? You came over at 16. You had a, you had a short time to try to, to get up. And then, uh, you know, and then you're in the military. You got guys barking at you and screaming at you in your secondary language. It had to be hell. All right. So I'm going to tell, tell you a little story about that one, too, when I was in the military, about, about me speaking English. But when I came here, you know, I didn't know a word of English. What I did is um, back then I, when I made friends, obviously you, you gravitate to the people that you know, people that are like you. Uh, we always do that everywhere we go, um, a culture, ethnicity or whatever. So I did tell a lot of my friends that people that I became friends with that knew English said, please don't speak to me in Spanish, speak, speak to me in English. If I don't understand it, please correct me and let me know what I'm doing wrong, what I'm saying wrong. I also didn't want to watch um, TV in Spanish anymore. To this day, I, I'm not used to anymore to watching TV in Spanish, but I got used to watching in English. And that's how I started picking up developing my, my hearing. And another thing that I did is uh, I got into, into hip hop and rap back then. And back then was no, no iTunes, no downloadable. It was cassette tapes. So cassette tapes, I had my Walkman. I would walk to school. I would put it in there. And while I would get into the train, I would listen to my Walkman, stop, write down what I listened. Keep going. And I tell you what, I will go through the same tape. Sometimes it will damage because, you know, when you rewind and you yeah, keep yeah. playing, it, sometimes you mess it up. But that was the way that I actually started picking up the language. And I was able to even pass the ASVA, the aptitude test to join yeah. the military. Now, when I went to, to basic training, um, so my, my drill instructor. So for the Marine Corps, it's drill instructor, but for the Army, it's drill sergeant. So it's the same thing, same, same hat. Same smoky hat, but um, um, they, they are your instructors at basic training. So one of those things that they said to me is, what's your name? And um, I, I responded to what my name was, but I was never happy because I have two last names. To this day, I was just stubborn enough. I wanted to keep my two last names. It was very hard to talk. 20 years, almost 21 years of service that uh, they come pack both of my last names together. And today, I really don't care. They just put them together. But my last name is a Strata Vega, two separate last names. Now. I decide to correct, all of a sudden, I don't know why, I decide to correct my drill instructor at basic training because I didn't understand what he was asking me. What was that for? Throughout the whole three months of basic training, every time that we would get smoked, meaning that we would have to push or do some type of exercise, everybody in my whole platoon would say, my name is Estrada Vega. So everybody knew me because of that. And that's because I didn't understand the, the, what was said to me and I wanted to correct my drill, my drill instructor. That's friggin' awesome. That's a huge oh, yeah. set of balls, brother. I love it, man. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing I love about doing these is, you know, I, I learned stuff that I, I didn't know about you before, but minor league cyclone baseball. I imagine yeah. you made friends fast with the, you know, uh, baseball's the, you know, America's greatest pastime, they say. So I, I imagine you made I some pretty good friends if you if you had some skills and they're like, I want Carlos on my team, right? So you oh, yeah. probably made some good friends there. Um, let's talk about your military training. So you probably, you know, without getting, you, I, I heard you've been stationed in Hawaii. You've been over in the sandbox. You, you know, I know you've done some stuff, but I do know that like you've probably done in your 20 plus career, worn a bunch of different hats, been in a bunch of different places, but you know, like what are your top three places uh, of, of living while you were in the military? And then, you know, your top three jobs. And I know one of your jobs is like super high speed, low drag stud shit that, uh, you know, you can tell me about that school you went to. Right. But, uh, you know, your top three places you lived that you enjoyed. And then uh, let's talk about your top three positions that you've had, you know, in the military right. that you, you love. Well, I, I lived in California for a while. I was stationed, even though that I was stationed in 29 Palms, which is the middle of the desert, the Mojave Desert. Um, I loved it because I was not too far from Las Vegas, Palm Springs, 
LA. So every weekend we would take a road trip. Friends of ours, I mean, we would go out there, have fun, young kids, drink. So at the time we're coming back, we're like breaking night, one, one sleep, the other one um, 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 drives. Think about it right now. It wasn't the safest thing to do, but we did it. Thank God that I'm here today. But um, I, I, love, I love California. Actually, I, when I got out of the Marine Corps, the first time I got out of the Marine Corps in 2004 for my active duty, um, August 2004, I decided to stay in, the, in, or in California with a friend of mine. So actually, I became a great friend with one of my sergeants. We both got up at the same time. And why I became a great friends with him is this, this man became like my brother. So to this day, he's more than my brother than my own brothers. He saved me from, a, from an explosion in Iraq. And for that, I'm thankful to him. I mean, he gets anything he needs at any time, whatever he needs. You know, he has a friend, he has a, 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 a buddy that will always be there for him. So. I mean, we started a company, construction company, but I needed to come back to New York to help my, my family, my mom. Um, he took the company and now this guy has a humongous construction company in LA. Beautiful, beautiful house. Um, he lives comfortably. He has a couple of uh, contracts with LA County, but um, that, that's a little, I, I view myself from the question, but California was one of, one of the best places. Um, don't get me wrong, I love New York, and I also love, even though Hawaii was one of the nicest ones, I love the culture of the Japanese people. I was in Okinawa, Japan, um, oh. I was stationed there for, for some training, but I love that culture, um, the yeah. way they carry themselves with honor, because that's yeah. one of the things that I, I love to carry myself with, honor, courage, character, and integrity. Yeah. Honor is something that actually is in the, in the Japanese culture, so I, I love that, that was one of the best places. Now, going back to the, the, the top three positions of the schools that I have, um, hands down, I mean, I went, to, like what you're saying, I went to um, Scout Sniper School. So Scout Sniper School was a, one of the toughest schools that I've ever been to. Now, I've also been to SEER School. So SEER, for those that don't know, is survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. So it's pretty much survival skills in military, um, military conduct on how to escape the enemy overall and return back to your unit, back to your country with honor. Now, Scout Sniper School, it was one of the toughest school, why? Because they measure your mental capacity. Yeah. Now, I went through basic training. Basic training for the Marine Corps was three months, um, um, about four more weeks more than every other branch of the service. And they have something called the Crucible, which is the last two weeks. The Crucible measures everything that you have trained to that point. And they put you to scenarios. Now, not only they, they, they ration your food, but they ration your sleep. And they make you go through scenarios that you need to pass. If you don't pass a crucible, you do not graduate. Now, to that point, I'm 17, 18 years old, I always proud myself not to cry. I'm a man who cry. You don't cry. You know, you've been an alpha man and, and so on. But when they gave me that EGA, what they call the eagle glove and anchor in my hand, boy, I bawled out. Mm -hmm. Tears came down. I... I I was like a baby, but I was so proud of myself because I did something that many didn't think that I was going to be able to do, but mainly me, I didn't think that I was going to be able to finish. I was able to continue and finish throughout the end. And that, that right there was the prize. So getting back to, to, uh, I, I you, you, you need to actually stop me when I... I, I, I know, I love it, man. So else. you got Sears, you got Scout Sniper School. Uh, Scout Sniper School, I'll tell you yeah. what, it's one of the best ones. Uh, a, a, a little little story when I was in Scout Sniper School. So they teach you how to, how to evade the enemy, how to um, um, conceal um, throughout the enemy and everybody else. And one night we're in, in, in a top of training where I got, um, I have to infiltrate the enemy. I didn't know what I was. Uh, I know that I laid down all of a sudden, 30 minutes later, I feel itching, itching, itching everywhere. I had laid down on the top of an um, 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 ant mount. Oh, it was man. the red ants, and boy, that went everywhere in my body. I had dots everywhere, scars all over my body. But guess what? I didn't move. That was one thing that I was proud of myself. So it was, it was a funny, funny situation. Oh, yeah. I, not only I laughed, but my instructor laughed harder. So uh, that was that. Now, in the, in the military, I also, even though that I love the position that I am right now, I'm, a, what, I'm what you call an NCOIC, an I commission officer in charge 
of the whole county of Long Island in New York for the New York Army National Guard. So yes, I was in the Marine Corps, now I'm in the Army, so Army National Guard. So I, I did a change because of family um, and many deployments in the Marine Corps and I wanted to change my lifestyle, be able to be more local and be able to, to have a family. So that was the change. But a, a training that I went through is OCS. I went to officer candidate school. So I'm one of the few ones in the whole state um, matter of fact, the only EA, the only master sergeant in the whole state that I ever been through that, but I never took my commission because, you know, I was, I was weighing the position of me becoming a, an officer, but becoming part-time or staying as a master sergeant and being a full-time. So I decided to stay with a full-time, which was, was paying the bills and um, um, supporting my family. So those are the top three, three positions that I ever, or that I, that I think I, I love the most. That's awesome, dude. So that's that's cool. So Marine Corps transitioned into the Army and um, E8. Now, for for people that don't understand, it's you know becoming an E8 is like it's it's three up and three down, Master Sergeant, and um, it's competitive. It's not like time and grade. There are certain positions, and you you know this, I know this, where if if you're if you're in the military long enough, you know, this next level is almost guaranteed, whatever. But then once you start getting into the nosebleed upper end NCO ranks, they're highly competitive. You know, talk about, you know, some of your your because you you got to want it, man. You got to interview and you got to study and, you know, kind of tell me about, you know, you, you got this physical game going on. You're tough as nails. You can lay in a frigging ant bed and not move because that's your job as a sniper. But then, like, for the studying and the cramming and to try to get to those upper echelon uh, NCO ranks, what was that like? How did you prepare yourself? And how did you edge out the competition? Because a lot of people want those uh, ranks. Correct, yeah. So it, it, it hasn't been easy. It is being rewarding because, yeah, actually, um, something that I could say is I developed resiliency. Um, I stretched my mind um, in a way that, I, I saw my competition. I didn't want it to be better than them. I wanted it to be the better version of me. Nice. I know what I was able to do. And um, so what set me apart, so let, let's just put it this way. Let me paint your picture. In the state of New York, there's only eight, E8 for the baton. Um, and we'll, we go all of from Suffolk County to Buffalo. So there's only eight of us in a unit that's more than 400. So yes, we fighting for those positions. So what set me apart is I took myself through school. So remember, I went through OCS. Mm -hmm. I got my MBA. I also got my master's on organizational leadership. I, I prepared myself. Some of the things that I want to do, prepare myself to go to board. So it's something that we do in the military. It's like an interview process. Mm -hmm. So you go through a board and you uh, they ask you a question, general knowledge about the military, general knowledge about uh, the job that you're going for or the position that you're actually competing for. So in this case, I was the, the state, region, and country. So at the state region, um, I was the recruiter of the year for the state of New York twice. There's only been three of us in the whole National Guard history. So we're talking about 17, 16, 1634, um, when the National Guard was started and the recruiting has started, that only two recruit or three recruiters have won the, the, or the title twice. And that's, I'm one of them. Oh, so wow. I wanted since yeah. since how far back? It's in the 1600s, since the when the oh, military man. started. So that's, since the recruiter that's... started, so in this position or this title um, went out. Um, there's only been three recruiters, three recruiters that ever won that position or that that title twice, and I and I've been one of them. So I won it for 2012, 2014. Um, and it was just me. I saw as preparing myself. I wanted to be the best version of me, and every mm -hmm. year was. I wanted to compound what I did the, the, the year before and I multiply and I was able to do it. So, and I was very proud of myself, but with that came a lot of, um, I put a lot of stress in my family too. So, and that's something that I will advise anyone. Yes, you want to go for, for, for the biggest things in the military or your career, but there's always going to be a balance. And right. I think this is where, where you come in the nice path. Everything that you do, you need to have a balance because yep. if you do one thing and one thing is heaven, the other one is, is light, you're not. You're never gonna have the balance yeah. of life, and you're gonna suck on one good and the other one. At the end of the day, that one is not gonna pay for everything. You are gonna be an unhappy person. But 
So I learned from that. I deviated, I actually went and I, and I saw what the, the pressure or the, the stress that I was putting on myself and everybody else. So I tried to start level, leveling every, everything, my career, my life, my physical, because throughout those years too, I was the greatest in, in, in recruiting, but I also, it also took a toll on my, my health, my physical. I started taking um, um, the same approach for high blood pressure. And I said, no, man, I can't do it. I can't live like this. So just like, 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 you, like, like, like we know, you know, we, we live by the, the spiritual, the mental, the physical. I started learning more about that. Okay. And that's what I needed to do back then. And that's and since those years, even though that I found out who I really was right. and what I was capable of, that also taught me. And I was able to learn that lesson from everything that I did on what I wanted to become. So, so that's, that's amazing, bro, because that's, that's so similar. And I think this is why you and I connect so well and, and why, you know, I feel like literally you're, I've known you my whole life, you know, cause yeah. we're, we're like souls and, and I, and I joke around when we talk, say, Hey, it's my brother from another mother, you know, yeah. but uh, for me, you know, just like what you're saying is, you know, I, I had my shit together with the physical, you know, I was a phenom, you know, I bench pressed 400 pounds in my life. I've done some amazing stuff. I used to leg sled 1200 pounds for my heavy sets and just, but, but, you know, when, when I was, um, but I had holes in my mental game and I had holes in my spiritual game, you know, I didn't have faith, didn't have faith in myself. And, and one of the things that you said, I wrote this down and I think this is very, I, I'm, I'm going to take this to heart. And, and I think you really hit on something that's, that's all about Carlos, you know, uh, when you, you weren't competing against the other people, what you, what you said, you were competing against yourself in a, in a, in a, in a way, because you wanted to become the best version of yourself because you knew that if you became the best version of yourself, you couldn't fail passing to that next level. And I think that's a badass way to look at, it. instead of looking at who I've got to beat and who I've got to conquer, you internalize that, which is a mental game. Right. Yeah. And then how can I be the best version of me? Because if I am and I truly express myself whole and healthy as a whole man, I can't lose that next promotion. I think that's badass, dude. That right. is fantastic. If, so, if you always try to be like the next person, the person right next to you, you will never be, you'll be a fake, a fake, you'll be an imposter. That's what we call an imposter. Right. You're trying yeah, to be you, like the person that, and you're never going to find yourself. You're never going to be unique. You never gotta have that that integral part of yourself that at the end of the day, and you could if you laid everything down and you lay your head on, on your bed, say, hey, I'm happy with what I did today. I did the best that I was able to do, not the best that I wanted to do for that person. Yeah. So you talked about some of you, you know, like you, you got on some high blood pressure medication, your health kind of yeah. so kind of walk me through the physical. Walk me through um a young man, what Carlos was trying to do to where you are now and kind of how you've you've settled in with your physical. Cause I know you've done fasting, I know you you're into nutrition and some other things, but just kind of walk me through like for me, when I was a younger man, I wanted to lift a friggin' house. And now I'm like, I want functional fitness, you know, I want to be able to do. Uh, you know, 15 pull-ups in a row without, without stopping. I want to be able to run a mile and a half without gassing at any given point in time. So I have some of these goals, but kind of walk us through the physical. And then I want to, I want to piggyback off that. And, and, you know, we've already talked about it a little bit. We'll get into the mental, mental and the spiritual, but let's talk about your, your physical phenom. Cause I mean, you're, you're, you know, you look like a Roman breastplate under that Under Armour t-shirt, you know, you just jacked in shaped stud, man. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, you know, funny enough. So the, the, let me let me tell you how my my road to to success physically, and that's what I call it, um, came about. Now, um, when I in two thousand and three, um, when I first deployed to Iraq, um, my second deployment, I was in a explosion in which, uh, like I said, my my friend pulled me out, and I was in a bed for almost six months. Um, I have a um, had a fracture vertebrae in L one and L two on the bottom of my spine. And they say that I was, you know, I probably would have needed to be um, medically retired. And they would put me to physical therapy. And I said, no, this is not going to happen to me. I'm not going to be like every other veteran that I see at the VA. No, this, I, I refuse to be that person. I started working out. I tightened my core. I tightened my muscles. I developed muscles around my spine to the point that I was able to do everything I wanted. So with that, I also um, decide to um, start doing 
bodybuilding. So I started doing bodybuilding and um, and I competed with the Marine Corps. So the funny thing is that I competed with the Marine Corps and um, the Marine Corps started sponsoring me because I was doing very well. So I started developing my, my body. I gained weight. I was like about 220 pounds. And, you know, I started lifting very hard. So it was like three of us and 29 pounds and we get getting sponsored. We like, we're getting comp for half of the times so we're working our jobs back then, like an infantry guy. And then the other, the other time, obviously, we needed to eat, we needed to work out. So it was just something that that base back then was doing for some some Marines in order to, to alleviate the job stress that we were going through, the deployments and everything else. So I took advantage of all of it. It was fun. Um, now, for some reason, even though that my body fat percentage was between 4 and 8%, mm. um, I... Um, my, the weight was actually causing me to have high blood pressure. I never paid attention to until I got out of the Marine Corps, came to, to, the, to New York. And you know, once you have a lifestyle, it's hard for you to get out of it because it, be, it becomes a habit. So I, I didn't keep working out the same, the same way because um, being a bodybuilder, it's, it's a full-time job. Um, the way that you eat, the way that you sleep, um, how you work out and macros and how many grams of, of protein you got to take for a pound. So it's, it, it was overwhelming. And I said, I will never do this. I did, I did two competitions. I went to that number one. The first one was Mr. Elena Tornaves and that number two. And the first one was Mr. Mr. Hollywood Tornaves and did that one and that number one. And I said, I will never do this again. <laughs> it, was, it was fun with it last day. I, I had pictures, I wore the shirt, but no, yeah. not, not anymore. I love food. That's one thing I do love food. <laughs> So throughout the years, you know, I, 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 in, you know, I experimented with a lot of different diets and certain things worked out for me. But coming back to it, to, to New York, um, I, I started developing high blood pressure and the way that I had was muscle and I was working out the same way became fat. So I said, yeah. No, it's not going to happen. This is not me. This is not the life that I said that I was going to live. So we need to change. So uh, learning about it, I started getting into um, becoming a, a personal trainer and I started learning more about how the body works, how diets. So I even started training um, um, old people with Parkinson or oh. all folks with Parkinson yeah. and um, um, prenatal. So women that were pregnant. So that, that's something that taught me a lot about the body and the biology. And I started implementing a lot of things for myself. So I was very good at that. Um, and I started losing the weight, I started putting up the, the proper muscles that I needed for myself. But different diets throughout the years didn't work for me. They would work for one month or two and I would keep going, my body would plateau. So a couple of years ago, I started hearing the, 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 the noise about fasting, intermittent fasting. Yeah, yeah. And I said, let me try because there was a lot of medical research behind it in which your body, especially as a man, um, produces more testosterone, you are able to actually um, recuperate a lot faster. Because for some reason in my whole career, I have tore my calves three times, one of them twice and um, um, the left one twice and the right one once. The last time that happened was in my lip and while I was doing the, the, the intermittent fasting. And for some reason, I mean, my body was able to assimilate, recuperate faster and do everything. And since I've been doing that, the intermittent fasting, I was able to lose weight. Don't get me wrong, I eat a lot now. I eat a lot. You see me, we we'll go to a buffet, I will eat a lot, but the days that I, I don't eat, that, that's my feeding days, but the days that I don't eat, I, I keep a good, a good diet throughout that day. I break my diet with bone broth, protein shakes in there, but that, that, that's the type of a diet that I found out that works perfect with my genes, works perfect with my, my, my anatomy. And that's something that, uh, hey, I, I, for me, it was for trial and error. For anyone else, I will advise them to go see a dietitian, go see a doctor that will actually tells you how your body works. Because I was lucky enough to find it early in life, right. and now in my fifties, so it, that works. But if you really want to get there now, I, I will advise anyone to study. And don't I'm not a I'm not a, a, a doctor, so don't take any advice from me. I would say consult with your doctor, but. You should, you should look into intermittent fasting. It was a great, one of the greatest diets that I ever tried that worked for me and keeps me in shape today. Sweet. So yeah, that's, that's great advice. And that was, that was something as you were, as you were telling me about it, I'm like, 
dude, can you email me your, your diet plan? But what, you know, what works for your metabolism and your size doesn't work for everybody. So that's great advice that, you know, and I think that's where a lot of people, Hey, this is my diet. This is my workout. This is my whatever. And then people try and they're like, this sucks. It's not real, but it's not necessarily true for their body. So, all right, brother, let's talk about, let's talk about the mental game. So you've had a couple of things you're, you're resilient. You can lay in an ant bed as a sniper. You know, you got that mental toughness. Um, you've, you've, you, you told yourself, I'm not going to lay in this friggin' bed and I'm going to heal myself. And then you went on to do great things. You've yeah. torn your calves, left one twice, right one once. And you got into this, inter- you healed yourself. Um, you know, what's your, you know, you've been, you're resilient. So well, your resiliency uh, mentally is, you know, a can do can't quit attitude, but what have you learned in that process? And it's not just all willpower. It has to, it has to come from, you have to fill yourself up, right? You have to have self-belief. So kind of walk through, Hey, I'm just a hard ass. I'm going to, I'm going to do it by will hook or crook versus where you are now. And it's like, take a deep breath. Let me be mature about it. This is what works for me. Yeah. So, Hey, look, I believe that nothing worthwhile is, worthwhile unless you take the risk okay now let me give you a little another story about what happened in phase three of OCS so when you're talking about um I tore one of my calves I tore it while going through phase three of OCS um middle of the night we're doing a a, a mission I'm fireman carry one of my one of my buddies because quote unquote he got hit so I need to take him up the hill all of a sudden I feel in the back of my calf like something snapped like a branch snapped and hit me in the back. I said, I probably something, I probably step over, over a branch and you snap and hit me in the back. When I step again, that's when my whole body came down. Mm-hmm. My calf tore. So I, I had to get, not only we have one, one, one victim, now we have two, two casualties right there. So they carry him out. They said, do you want to continue OCS or you could want to come back? I said, no, I'm going to continue. So my buddies, and this is one thing, like I love this is why I wanted this is why I love the military, because you you think you think as a team, a group. They found this that we call it the Moses stick. And by the end of OCS, everybody signed it and I still have it. Oh, badass. I went everywhere. I had a weapon, I had an M694 with me and my stick. So it was like Moses. I was everywhere, <laughs> went through all missions with that. <laughs> it was funny though, it was funny, but at the end of the day, even the commander's like, what are you doing? You know what? I'm proud of you. Just continue. So um, that, that's one thing. Now, something I want to touch is something that I learned a little while ago. It says Nelson Mandela said that no passion to be found, plain small, setting for a life less than you are capable of leading. Yeah. So there's no passion out there. That if, you don't, if you don't put everything to it, it's not worth living or worth doing. Now, something we got to keep in mind is we're going to fail at some point in our, of our lives. We all gonna suck at something. We all gonna fail. But something that I can guarantee is that if you don't stay consistent to it, you won't accomplish what your life desires. So what I do, I mean, every day, every day, something that we have to keep in mind is that when we wake up, our, our, our mind is actually working at a, what is it? I, I read a study the other day that said that your, your brain works at a 10.5 brain cycles per second. And that's the time when you're actually, you're, you're more prone to learn things. So what I do, I wake up between 5, 5.30 every single morning. I work out. And while I'm working out, I never listen to music. I will listen to you at a podcast, motivational video or, or audio, uh, a book. And those are the times that I, I feed myself. Not only I work out, I keep myself in, in shape, but I also feed my mind mm-hmm. because that set the stage for how I'm going to be for the rest of the day. And that's the way I see it. The days that I have a, a off night and I cannot work out in the morning for some reason, I feel out of place throughout the day. Like I got to sit down and think what I'm doing. Like I don't have a structure and, and, and I'm not able to actually give my full hundred percent of what I'm looking to do that day. So that's, that's how I started the day. Now, some things that, that, that I keep like mentally, you never quit. Yep. Think about think about Thomas Edison. Yep. Thomas Edison did a thousand failed experiments. Yeah. But guess what? The thousand and one was reliable, right? Yeah. Also, yep. Reggie Jackson. 
Reggie Jackson, you know, he struck out more than 2,600 times. But you don't hear about that. You hear about the, 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 the home runs that he always did. But guess what? They never quit. They always continue. But guess what? If you're going to do something and you're successful at it, we are going to fail more at what we're going to be successful at. Yeah. I heard one the other day. Well, Michael Jordan has something similar about how many game-winning shots he won, and then he talks about how many he, he didn't make. But don't, people don't remember that. I saw on Instagram, there was like, there's like a train, like a ranger, a ranger up something. I get some of these ads or whatever. And it had, uh, it had a lion, you know, in it's walking. And it says the lion's success rate is 17%. So out of every hundred tries, the lion only kills something 17 times wow. to survive. But yet he is still considered okay. the king of the jungle and he doesn't quit. So, you know, that's, that's, that's badass. I, I love the way you say that. And yeah, your mental and the way you set your day, we, we've heard it in, in our mastermind group, you know, morning rituals and you've got yours and that's all good stuff. Tell me about the, uh, tell me about the spiritual brother. So, you know, I can get hippie and I can talk to trees and I can play my American Indian flute and I'm very spiritual and I love mother earth. And I imagine in, a, in, a, in my last, my first podcast, I talked to about a, with a law enforcement buddy of mine about, yeah. you know, guardian angels whispering in my ear and saying, hey, don't don't go down there just yet. Wait for backup. And I do believe there's been some divine intervention in my life. I do believe in a greater power. Tell me where you're at with that, bro, because I'm sure being your experiences, you've, you've, you've probably had some really good talks and whispers in your ear. Yeah, man, your experience is when you go through the worst, that's when everybody gets religious. You always hear that. Um, you always try to negotiate with God. If you give me this, this is what. But I'll tell you what, um, I believe in God, um, even though that um, um, I'm not, haven't always stuck by him, I know that God has stuck by me. Yeah. And uh, today, um, as I'm taking the path and to better myself every single day, so that, that's something that, that, uh, that I always think in doing and is to be a better man, better father, better partner, better businessman, integrity. What would Jesus do? And it's funny enough, if I was in Jesus' um, shoes, would he do this type of business? Would it be the integral part? Or am I doing this with honor? Yeah. Am I taking care of my brother, my sister? So that's something that I always keep in mind. Yes, I always pray. I'm not, I'm not the religious type, but I do believe in God. And I know there's a God out there that is always looking out for us and always wants to be a better, better person so we can make a better universe, better, better world, um, better family, better community. So it's just something that I, that I keep in mind in everything that I do, yeah. but I'm not that religious type, okay? Oh yeah, no, that's, that's me. I don't go to church, but yeah. uh, I... I I can talk to him any, any and every day. Right. So speaking of that, you know, like we want to leave, we want to leave the world better than we found it. Right. And we want to make a positive impact. So that's a perfect segue into what are you doing, Carlos? Uh, you know, what are you doing with your life? How are you trying to positively impact people? I know you got some real estate stuff going on. I know you, you looking into a nonprofit, but for those that are interested, Carlos is going to Give me some imp information and hyperlinks. I'll put it down in the strip description and uh, you can get a hold of him. You look at what he's doing, but he's got some amazing things and he's tr truly trying to positively impact lives. And uh, let's let's share that, brother. What you got going on? All right, brother. Um, so um, our company, uh, we are the Warriors Investors. So we are what's called the Alpha Tribe, which kind of goes with the company now too. Um, we teach um, young or elders, um, novice, um, see some real estate investor, how to be the best version of themselves, how to be the alpha version in everything that they do, uh, mentality, the discipline, um, and also the strategies. Now, we actually coming out with a course in um, real estate flipping and um, wholesale. And also there's a book that we're coming on by next month. Just look for it. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to put it on, the, on our, our links below with uh, Matt. And um, so that, that's something that we've been doing currently. Uh, at the same time, we have a nonprofit, something that why I am doing the business, why am I, am I working so hard to actually get everything going even before the, the uh, middle of the year? It's because my passion 
and one of my goals and you know my, my my vision my why in life is my kids i base everything that i do is how am i impacting their life for the better something and everything that i do in, in everything and all my businesses and in this foundation that i'm about to tell you is i want to see and i want to be able to define what my kids will say i'm a feeling what my eulogy will be Mm -hmm. And this is why we're starting the K Autism Foundation. Uh, my youngest son, is, um, he's on the spectrum, he's autistic, and I hold this very dear to my heart. Um, I'm always trying to learn more about it. But not only that, I want to help a lot of, a lot of parents out there, single parents. Um, parents that don't know how to deal with this situation, especially because there's so many um, systems out there throughout the state that parents don't know about because of the law of recourses. Um, they have no money. They, they don't know who to go to. So this is something that we're working on. And by the end of the year, this year, um, 2021, we're going to come out with the K Fund, um, K Autism Foundation, which is for my son, Cal. So stay tuned. We'll, we'll put more information out. You guys go to warriorsinvestors.com you will be putting out more information so you guys are able to help, um, get involved, volunteer, um, whatever you guys can in order to help the cause. Dude, that's badass, brother. That is badass. Man, and uh, one thing uh, I'll just, you know, I can kind of geek out on this because uh, Carlos trusted me with some, uh, you know, he and I, you know, here's, here's my symbol and then like he and I are both sitting here what are our logos going to be? And we were going back and forth. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? And uh, dude, you got, you got friggin' stud, you know, logo. I love it, man. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, we, we talked about some other things, just a little round, little round thing that you can hand people or whatever. Right. And it's oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the coins, challenge coins. So we're going to have uh, some challenge coins. We're going to have some merch too. We actually got um, some of some of the merch came in today too. So we're putting it out too. It's gonna to be the Warriors Investor, the Alpha Tribe. Um, actually, um, next next month we're gonna be seeing each other. I'll take some stuff for you too, man. Absolutely, brother. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for your time. Nothing but love and respect for you. And I I loved interviewing you as a pal because I learned so much more about you, man. And uh, hell, I feel like I, I know you even better. And all the best for you. If you ever need anything, you reach out to me. Thanks for being a part of this. No, no, thank you for having me. And, you know, lastly, I want to leave with everybody, please don't inspire just to make a living, but inspire to make a difference in life. There you go. That's a perfect way to close it up. My man, have a great rest of the day. We'll catch you soon. This has been the Nice are. Path Podcast. Carlos Estrada Vega. Booyah. Care, bro. Right. Later, bro. Have it.